Hi, I'm Thomas Cross Hoops, and I'm a seeker of truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In my pursuit of truth, truth found me, and now I can't stop following him. Join me and my guests as we pursue truth together. Welcome to Seeker of Truth podcast, a place to fill the airwaves with stories and testimonies about how God still moves in people's lives today and how faithful Jesus is. And we have a special guest today, Frank Viola. Frank's a conference speaker, blogger, and a best-selling author. He helps serious followers of Jesus know their Lord more deeply so they can experience real transformation and make a lasting impact. Viola's blog, frankviola.org, is regularly ranked in the top five of all Christian blogs on the web, and his podcast, Christ is All, reached number one in Canada and number two in the U.S. on Apple Podcasts. How are you doing, Frank? Hey, I'm well, and I'm happy to be on your show. Ah, it's a, it's a, honestly, I'm excited to sort of become one of my catchphrases, but I'm just following the Lord and excited to, uh, to have you on. Um, definitely... Before we jump in and discuss some, some of the topics from your best-selling book, 48 Laws of Spiritual Power, I wanted to ask you about an article from, um, from earlier on in your writings, Rethinking the Fivefold Ministry, that my father sent me. It was actually the first, um, my introduction to your writings. Hmm. And in that article, under um, you, you talked about the error of titles and offices. Mm-hmm. You explain that the words we've often mistranslated as titles are, are merely functions that members of the body will flow in as the Spirit leads. Um, a little further up in the article, you told a story about how in a, in a setting of a church, the Lord really led you and your team to lay down all your preconceived ideas of what the giftings in fivefold would look like. And as the body pursued the Lord, those giftings naturally emerged where, where needed. And I would just love for you to expand a little bit more on how we as modern day believers can better understand the function and reason for the fivefold without falling into that trap of making it titles and special positions like they do in businesses. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Well, it's really interesting because today, and this has been going on for a long time, uh, people have taken the various functions in the New Testament, whether it's apostle, prophet, evangelist, and use those as honorific titles for themselves and for others. And it's prolific on social media too. Even today, Thomas, I was looking through my Facebook page and um, you know how Facebook recommends you to add friends? Well, I had this whole list of friends and one person was uh, Katie and her title uh, very clearly on the page was prophetic evangelist (laughs) and so i just thought oh my goodness another one apostle apostle tom's no offense to you but it was was apostle tom something else and uh and then you know prophet prophetess and it's so sad because all uh, such people are doing is they're copying what they see others doing And the whole idea of a title is to get honor. Hey, look at me. I'm this. I'm that. In the New Testament, the term apostle, prophet, evangelist, even shepherd, they were never used as titles. For example, you'll never see in the New Testament the phrase, the apostle Paul. No, it's Paul the apostle. And he only used that when he was writing to a church and he was trying to explain to them in reaction to what was happening by his detractors, he was basically saying, I'm Paul, I'm a sent one from the Lord, and I raised you up <laughs> as an ecclesia. It was not an honorific title. And uh, so, yeah, we have this uh, propensity to turn these ministries into titles, and the and it's just tradition. It's human tradition. It's religious tradition. And what's behind it is the desire to be honored and admired. Um, A true apostolic worker is not going to go around calling himself an apostle. A true evangelist is not going to say, hey, look, I'm an evangelist. (laughs) And there is a difference between the function, and that's what these were. They were functions in the body of Christ and creating some kind of an office that has some kind of official authority to it 
And that's just a whole nother discussion. But I would encourage anybody who is interested in seeing the difference between how the ministries, particularly the ministries of apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, how they operated in the first century, what they were in the first century versus what they became later on and what they are today. Yeah. And and I guess it's okay for somebody that's recognizing, you know, as they're you know, I, I like some of the some of the writings that you have that puts words to things. Honestly, reminded me of being a YWAMer uh, growing up on the missions field. I read a lot of Floyd McClung and Tom Marshall, and that's when I read your article. It just reminded me of, of that. They they talked about what tr- you you broke it down in one of your books. What true leadership, true authority, you know, the Greek words. What you you do the same thing they do, and I think some people just aren't exposed to that type of. Um, you know, understanding that it, it is, it's verbs, not nouns. They're not positions of authority. They're, they're, it's, you know, like I heard one thing where it's talking about submitting in the spiritual and Christianity, it's coming under one heart. You know, I think that's how Floyd McClung re- referred to it. And it's, it's different than what we have these ideas when we model it after the, you know, the Western businesses almost. And that's what our church has become. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, but people can read this article if they go to frankviola.org and look in the article section, and you could do a search and find it. And I know yeah. for your show, you'll have it in the show notes. So. Exactly. I actually have on uh, seekeroftruth.co, I have your uh, a page with your all links to all your websites. I actually already wrote a blog about 48 Laws of Spiritual Power, and I had already referred to that article. So I updated it. I added the current uh, mm. link to that article so people mm. can read it. And, and speaking of this book, I really am enjoying it. I just love your style of writing. I've, I've, I've read some of all the whole books. I've read pieces of other books. Um, I think Pagan Christianity was in the first ones I started. But this book, I love it because um, it, it is. It's just a simplistic manner of, of truth and wisdom. In the 48 Laws of Spiritual Power, you share practical truths that will benefit every believer in a powerful and simplistic manner. In Chapter 4, it takes one to make one. You say that the idea that the key ingredient to effective ministry is personal transformation. I just love that. I underlined it like eight times. Smacks in the (laughs) face of virtually all pastors' seminars, leadership conferences, where the emphasis is put on strategies, techniques, higher education, style, you know, smoke screens. (laughs) And, uh, and, And I love that. And how can not only leaders... But all believers ensure that they're more focused and working on their own character as opposed to just trying to look the part, um, you know, fix everything so it fits in a box. What does it look like to lead others out of a healthy relationship with the Lord and not just these flashy programs and infrastructures? And, you know, I, just, I was reminded of an article my dad sent me about Bill Hybels where he said after 20 years it was proven that all the programs did nothing to grow in, you know, uh, maturity it just mm. grew the body it didn't grow mature believers and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no that's a great question uh, you know that chapter it takes one to make one one of the big points i make in it is that you cannot give to others what you yourself have not experienced at least not in a way where they're deeply impacted and changed okay So what we have today is we have a lot of preachers and pastors, and and I know this from firsthand experience because I train leaders. I work with pastors. I work with preachers. And a lot of this is by their own confession. Um, But they will often be hunting for sermon material Saturday night and then preach it on Sunday morning, but they themselves have never experienced what they're Mm. preaching. Yeah. And so it, it moves from one notebook to the other. And when you do that, and it's very common, it will never get past the frontal lobe uh, into the spirit, into the heart where transformation takes place. Now, I have a, an answer to your question. I have a, a mastermind um, that is designed for pastors and teachers. And we spend a year together. It's mostly online, but we do have a four days in person. And most of the guys who are part of it, uh, they are pastors and teachers in their 30s and early 40s. Anyway, um, we focus not on what usually is focused on uh, in pastors' conferences, leadership conferences, which is, you know, how can I get a better strategy? How can I get more people in the seats? How can I get a bigger budget? You know, how can I evangelize more individuals? What are the techniques? What are the tactics? Uh, how can I learn more in the higher education? 
how can I have a better style? Those are the things that are focused on in virtually all of the leadership and pastoral conferences that go on today. What we do, brother, is we deal with how do I know the Lord Jesus Christ better? How do I encounter him in a real living way? How do I learn to walk in his spirit? And there is such a difference between focusing on inner transformation uh, opposed to outward gift. And many Christians today, including leaders, they're, they're attracted to outward gift, mm-hmm. right? Instead yeah. of inward transformation. And the Lord is interested in inward transformation. He's interested in the inward transformation of the believer because that's really where he gets glory. And that's where real spiritual impact takes place. You know, there's a big difference between preaching out of experience and something you have gone through yourself and you have met the Lord in that place. That's going to have greater impact than if you give the same message, you give the same words, you know, you say the same words, but you have not experienced it. That's going to fall short and it's not going to have eternal value. So, That's the focus of that chapter that you mentioned in 48 Laws of Spiritual Power. And in this mastermind, if anybody's listening that has a ministry, you know, you preach or teach, you might want to check it out. Go to Ministry Mind. That's all one word. Ministry Mind, M-I-N-D, ministrymind.org. And it'll teach you about what the mastermind is. You get testimonials from the different pastors and teachers who've gone through it. But we're focusing on knowing the Lord. Yeah, I definitely read some of the some of the men were, you know, just in, it it was an eye opening experience for them and a heart transforming experience to to, yeah, walk with you, especially those four days where you guys were in person. They loved that. But just the weekly um, time they spent together, they said it really uh, impacted their ministry a lot. Yes. And in answer to your question, what we do is we learn how to experience Christ and some very novel, creative ways that go beyond, you know, pray and read your Bible, which is the typical prescription that's given to us when we ask anything that's practical. Um, And one of the things that I would say to anybody who's interested in your question about how do we lead others, what does it look like to lead others into a healthy relationship with the Lord, is ask this question. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, It is not I who lives, but it is Christ who lives in me, okay? Paul was talking about living by the indwelling life of Christ. Jesus Christ dwells in every true believer by the Spirit. Paul says, I live by his life. It is not I, but Christ who lives through me, right? Uh, Paul said in Philippians, uh, you know, to live is Christ. So I would ask this question, and this is at the heart of discipleship. Real discipleship is learning how to live by the indwelling life of Christ. If you're someone who wants to know how to do that, and most Christians do not, if you ask them, how practically do I live by Christ, so it's not me living, it's Christ living, most of them will not be able to give an answer to that question out of experience. And that's true for pastors and teachers, brother. It's just, it's just a fact. Ask someone who you look up to and respect that question. If they cannot say to you, I know exactly how to do that, and I can share with you from my experience how to do it, but I would move on to the next person, okay? Yeah. And, and I'm giving you my own testimony because as a young Christian in my 20s, I had that very question, and I searched and searched and searched, and eventually I found the answer to it, and I, I created a whole course. It's called Living by the Indwelling Life of Christ <laughs> that many, many thousands of people have taken. It's online. But I did that because to me, brother, that's the heart of discipleship. It's the heart of the Christian life. It's to live Christ. It's to have Christ live through you, through me, rather than us living our own life. And so anyway, that's that's what it looks like, brother. It looks like teaching people how to live by Christ because the one who's teaching it has already done it. And we're learning that together. And we focus on that in the ministry mind, uh, mastermind as well. No, I, I really like that. And it's kind of been a theme on this podcast. I'm, I'm 41 years old, so I'm your, I'm your target market for that, it sounds <laughs> like. Um, 
I, uh, you know, I went through YWAM. My, my parents were on staff as a, as a kid, youth with a mission. And, you know, their motto is to know God and to make him known. And when mm-hmm. I was in my early 20s and I went through DTS, you know, I had just come back from living in the world and being wild. And I, I wish I had put more focus on that to know God, because at that age, everybody wants to go make him known and the travel right. the world and doing right. physical labor and loving on people and holding kids in orphanages. That's all great. And the Lord uses it. But, you know, it took me 20 years of growth and inner healing and development to really mm. realize that, that was the, the key was right there to know him. So, right, yeah, brother. It's, uh, Amen. It's really good. Well, the next chapter, I I just like that one, too, because some of this is just small practical stuff. Um, And and being in missions and travel, I have met, you know, some some different uh, celebrity ministers and pastors. And it's amazing how some of them are just so genuine and humble and loving. But unfortunately, even in the Christian world, some of them are unapproachable. And, you know, and and you um, chapter five says detest celebritism. I can't even say it. Celebrity. Detest celebritism. Um, you outline how important it is for leaders to remain approachable, even to the point where they should have at least one avenue where people get can get in touch with them directly. I know you said maybe they have an assistant, you know, go through mm-hmm. emails, but they should yep. have one one way. Yes. I, I honestly have to admit, over the years, um, I think since ten years ago, um, I have had the opportunity to email you about an article or a question, um, something through Facebook Messenger, uh, definitely your email from your website. And to my surprise, you responded and always pointed me in the right direction. Um, why is it so important and why should leaders be approachable, especially by those who they're leading? Because some churches, you can't even get a hold of the pastor that's leading you. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. Well, I think one of the big reasons is that when you have put yourself, and I'm speaking you in general, I'm talking to leaders in the position of a celebrity. And what that means is nobody can approach you. You're not accessible, okay? Not even to your peers, which unfortunately is is, is the case in many cases. Um, you, a brother or sister, have an inflated view of yourself. Your ego has not gone to the cross. And if Jesus Christ can be approachable (laughs) and you can't, um, you know, to put yourself on the level of a Taylor Swift or a Johnny Depp uh, where people cannot get to you, something is wrong. And it's unfortunate because many of the Lord's people, they don't pay attention to this. They don't really care about it. But I, I notice And I'm someone who is in leadership and, you know, have best-selling books and speak in conferences. And I know a lot of a lot of my peers and many of them are approachable and they're accessible. And I have great respect for them because they get this. But there's some who are not. And they're my own peers. And, brother, I can't even reach them. (laughs) They have handlers, okay, that put these walls up and even their peers can't get to them. And so it's 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 in the drinking water of the Christian world, this cultural this culture of celebrity. And what it also does is it it invites the Lord's people to idolize human beings Mm -hmm. and to put them in a position of worship, even though they may not say they're doing that. Their actions uh, are very much aligned with worshiping a human being. So those are just some of the reasons why it's so dangerous. And in that chapter, I excoriate the celebrity culture in the Christian world. And I'm speaking to all of the Lord's people, but especially to people who are going to take the helm of ministry or they're in ministry. And it's kind of a sharp rebuke that, hey, you know, you're not Tom Cruise, okay? Uh, <laughs> lower yourself a little bit here and make yourself accessible. Now, of course, somebody hearing this may say, oh, well, I'm going to go ahead and now I'm going to slam this person with multiple emails, and they're a little off mentally, okay? Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why some people I insulate themselves so much is because there are crazy people in the body of Christ, but that's still not an excuse right. to be approachable, especially to your peers. But, you know, but not everybody's on the level like Bill Johnson or Mike Bickle or yourself, you know, and so there's a lot of people that 
do the same things that a person that might get 20,000 emails in a week that, you know, and you might get a hundred and you're still doing the same thing. So I think your point is honestly that, you know, we shouldn't elevate ourselves and think too highly of ourselves. And the funny thing is, um, I'm sure you know who Heidi Baker is and, and, uh, Roland Baker. Um, I, you know, that, that does uh, Iris Ministries in Mozambique, and she's just amazing. And, you know, she had to do the the, com the lunch with the pastors, and her husband just hung out with me and my friend, and we had both served in, in uh, missionaries in China, and Roland, his family came from missionaries there as well. He hung out with two men for an hour during lunch. He didn't go sit down and have lunch. He just hung out with us in the room yep, yep. and, you know, prayed for us, and we were talking in Mandarin together. And I'm, I'm just going to be honest. That one-on-one -on -one time with someone when the whole room left for, for lunch at, during the conference, the little pastor's lunch was going on. And for him to spend that time, like he, was a, he had just come through like that brain healing and stuff. He could have gone and had lunch and isolated himself from the common man. But yep. he was like, nope, I'm going to stay here and talk to you guys. Yep. And that does yep. more healing for a heart of someone that needs real intimacy and relationship from the Lord. Then, you know, than any email would. So it's, it's cool to see some people are approachable and, you know, that's all we can do is pray that, that people get it. Um, you know, you are, you are definitely in, in media and social media and you mm -hmm. know, multiple podcasts at this point. Um, I was thinking about it when I, when I was thinking of questions to ask you and these next two are kind of similar, but, mm -hmm. um, what role do you believe Christian literature and podcasts play in fostering a deeper understanding of faith and spirituality in today's world? Well, the question really hangs on the quality of the resource, okay? So there's two things going on here. Um, the vast majority of what is available on podcasts, YouTube, and in your social media and your websites, etc. cetera, um, I'm just gonna be honest, it is shallow. It's shallow. Mm. It's either aimed at the frontal lobe, which means it's very mindy and intellectual, or it's aimed at the emotions. Mm. And it causes people to chase after uh, emotional experiences or um, signs and wonders or those sorts of things. And in both cases, the Lord Jesus Christ and a deeper walk with him that's real, vibrant, and living, where transformation of the spirit okay, is really taking place, that is very rare even today. Mm -hmm. And so a lot, of, a lot of what's happening with social media is the, and I'm, I'm talking about my peers now, okay, uh, the big ministries, all right, you, that, you know, um, that have huge followings on social media, brother, they are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in ads, that's how they're getting it, all right? They're getting the likes. They're getting the follows. They're spending an, an obscene amount of money on that. And, you know, and that's okay. That's their prerogative if they want to do that with donations that are given to them. Um, I've taken a different path. And what that means is voices like mine, we're not going to have those huge numbers because I don't, I don't want to make Elon Musk rich. I don't want to make Mark Zuckerberg rich, okay? Yeah. I'm not going to pay a penny on advertising, but I'll tell you what. The Lord knows the hungry and the thirsty, the people who say in their heart, there's got to be more than this. Mm. There has to be. And they're the ones that find my work. And even though I don't have these big numbers only because I'm not paying this kind of money for it, the ads, um, the Lord connects people and if you have a hungry and thirsty believer who's been through all of it, you know, they've been part of this movement. They were part of that movement. They went to this training. They went to this conference. They followed this guy. They followed this woman. And they're at the point now where they say, wait a minute. I haven't really changed. <laughs> I still have the same struggles. Yeah. I don't really know the Lord that well. I mean, I can say I do, but really I don't. I'm hungry and thirsty for him, not things about him, but for him. The Lord will direct those people to those who are out there. The other side of it is the people who are producing the deeper Christian life material, uh, the, the stuff that's deeper, that goes beyond the intellect and the emotions, but goes right to the spirit. 
and that presents the riches of Jesus Christ in profound, captivating ways, yeah. they have to be on there. And that's why, you know, I do have two podcasts. That's why I do have a blog I write every Thursday, um, a fresh article. That's why I do have books. So I'm I'm on there, and, and those who are uh, part of my tribe, they are as well. But we have intentionally made the decision that we're not going to go down the road of being a celebrity. Right. We're, and I've avoided that intentionally by doing a number of things. Like I don't have a Facebook fan page. Um, that was an intentional decision. I don't go on video, um, which, you know, all of my peers do. And I made some decisions that are unconventional, but God has seen to bless that and bring the, the kind of people who are hungry and thirsty into my world. Mm -hmm. And so we learn from one another. So it's been a, a blessing. So, I yeah, that. I love that. And, and, you know, I, I try to do the same thing. I try to push or promote only those who I see living that life of intimacy and character. And, so, you know, I've said it a lot on my mm -hmm. podcast. Like Andrew Womack is just one of my favorite Bible teachers, I call like the most balanced of, you know, faith and grace. And if you meet his staff, they're all healthy, whole, mature, nobody pointing to themselves, everybody pointing to Jesus. And, you know, his ministry is popular but it also isn't popular because his whole ministry is about the word and get back to the word and read the word and what does jesus say and it's not flashy and it's not you know not chasing signs and wonders now now do miracles happen when he prays for people sure but that doesn't mean he's chasing them and you know i love that kind of ministry he's he's uh, put himself out there but he's not um not trying to build a you know a celebrity himself i think he's known but only within our circles kind of thing i do uh i do I do think it's important to to not promote or push a book forward unless you you see the character on it because that's one thing I've seen in the in the in the Christian world. Often there's people that are so charismatic, but the character's not there, and that is so important to me. Well, I guess you kind of answered the last question, but um, in this rapidly changing cultural landscape, how do you see the future of Christian communication evolving, and how do you plan to adapt your work to continue mm -hmm. engaging with your audience effectively, which you may have just answered? But. You know, this is a question about foresight, and we're living in a world that's so rapidly changing, and I think right now, you know, the major... Um, Social media outlets are YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, uh, which is now Meta, right? And by the time uh, people hear this five years from now, they're probably going to be rebrandings of those particular outlets as well. <laughs> yeah, no, um, Twitter is X, Facebook's Meta. Yep. <laughs> okay, my Twitter bad. Twitter just became X. I stand I corrected. I, I knew <laughs> that. I just misspoke. But yes, X is Twitter. And meta, yeah, and so by the time, you know, five years from now, it'll all be different. But anyway, um, so so now there's a new thing called threads, which um, I have an account on, but I don't use it. There's zero followers intentionally. So every time somebody tries to follow me, I <laughs> decline because I'm not on it. And I have a note in my profile that says I'm not using this. Uh, I chose not to use it. Um, but there may come, and I hope there is. Here's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that there's going to emerge a social media platform that's new, but that will attract um, people between the ages of 21 and 45, but it's not based on short videos or photos, mm. okay? Because right now, the majority of, of people in that age range, and those are my readers, okay? The majority of my readers, the people who consume my two podcasts, Christ is All and the Insurgents Podcast, the people who read the books, the people who are on the blog, get the emails every Thursday from frankvalo.org, they're between the ages of 20 and 45. That's a majority of them. Now, there's some older and there's some younger, okay? But I'm talking about, like, the, the size. Yeah, your demographic. Your the demographic to target. It was a primary. Okay, now, the majority of those people, though, are on TikTok. majority of those people are on um, Instagram. Um, some are on Twitter. Not that many. And uh, not that many are on Facebook, uh, maybe in the 40s. Um, but the visibility of, say, Facebook is horrible and then you know I'm not somebody who does these short little videos um, like others do you know the trailers is so to speak 
and I'm not photo uh, um, dominant. So basically what I do is I put out articles and I put out podcast episodes that are robust, meaty, you know, and on I YouTube. Like like yeah. It. And so so we need a platform, right, that I'm looking for a platform that many of, of my target audience is on it, but it's not just driven by photos and short videos. Mm. And so I'm looking for that. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, um, but my eye is on it because even though I have this huge audience of the demographic between 21 and 45, which is the next generation, and that's what my eye is on, um, you know, it's important that that age group share with one another. And if yeah. you don't have, if you're not spending, you know, an obscene amount of money on ads and so forth, then it's going to have to come directly from the Lord and from those who consume your content to share it. Well, like we're on this show, I'm sure you have people in that That's audience, really that age range right here. So this is a way that they'll get exposed to it. And if there's something in their heart that says, there's got to be more than this. All right. I really want the Lord more yeah, than I have really him now. Than, and, and then I'm speaking their language. Been wanting to, yeah. On the seeker of truth.co on the website, I, I do link a page to all my guests. I like to promote to their websites or books or, you know, YouTube videos, Spotify, whoever, if it's a worship leader, I, you know, I love to point back to the people that are on, but I have been doing some original writings or, you know, I read a chapter in your book and I did a little blog about it and I'll point back to your book. I'll, I'll put a link to it where they can purchase it. And, you know, that's, that's kind of something I try to do is always always put what blesses me out there for others to read and Amen. see. And I do need to get back to writing weekly. I had lost about 10 articles I wrote trying to learn these new platforms and GoDaddy. And I was so upset. <laughs> I honestly didn't write. And I was like, I even knew that I should be copying, pasting these from a Word document into the web builder. But why did mm. I didn't my original ones? And so, yeah, that kind of I've read some of your stuff on writing. I know there's books in me. So. I'm following some of your stuff, and I just got to get back. I think I need to do that right once a week and put up my blog about whatever the Lord's speaking to me about. Because I do think, you know, Joe Rogan single-handedly saved long-form, you know, minds. People people right. are hungry for more than a little five-minute blip or a little yep. one-minute video on, uh, on Reels. So, Frank, I do just want to thank you for coming on. It was such an honor. I do ask all of my guests, if you're willing, I'd love to have you pray a blessing over the end of the show if there's you know the audience can just receive it in the god mm. is outside of time and space and i would love for you to do that and and close with just knowing that um i'll link to all your stuff seeker of truth.co episode 25 be a uh, link to frank and all his websites and books and things like that on the mm. website mm. i appreciate it brother i do uh i'll say a prayer well lord um every person who's listening to this uh, every person who listens to it in the future, a year, two years, five years, ten years, I pray, Lord, that you would capture the heart of those who have a hunger and thirst for more, more of you. And those who don't, put that in them, Lord. Bring them to a place circumstantially where they cry out and say, there has to be more than this. And, Lord, you are a God of depth. Um the riches that are in Christ are unsearchable, unfathomable, untraceable. And uh, I pray, Lord, that you would lead them to water and uh, continue to raise up ministries of depth, uh, ministries that are sharing the riches and the treasures and, um, and that live in water, uh, that your people may be blessed and grow into um, your image. And uh, that's what I ask. And I pray for Thomas, you just bless what he puts his hand to and all the things that you put in his heart, that you would guide him step by step, uh, that those things may be fulfilled for your glory. In your yes, name. Lord. And I just Amen. thank you so much for Frank and that anybody that hears these words, Lord, would just be just so welcome to pursue you deeper at a deeper level yes. and just know that there's resources out there if they want to go to you know learn more about you mm -hmm. and new things and even frank's own website's got all kinds of resources for people to grow and find mm -hmm. out more about how they can connect with you lord mm -hmm. i just thank you for his ministry his books his writing i just bless everything mm -hmm. he's doing lord and mm -hmm. thank you so much for the call in his life that he's obedient and that he's honoring that call in mm -hmm. jesus name amen amen Hi, 
Thank you so much for listening. Please like and subscribe to the Seeker of Truth podcast. And also visit our website, seekeroftruth.co, for more information about all of our guests and how you can hear more from them. I pray this conversation encouraged, uplifted, and inspired you to pursue truth at a deeper level.